Hi, welcome to a very special Dear God We Had an Election uh, episode of Politics for People Who Hate Politics. My guests uh, tonight are Joe, and we all know who Joe is because he's always here. Uh-huh. Ever stalwart and half-assed. That's his motto. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah. That, sh- that would have been a good lower third for you, actually. Yeah, I wish you had said that before. <laughs> Sorry. Better read than Dad's a classic. Um, we also have M.K. Lords, who I'm going to give her the pro- I'm going to. I don't pretend not to be reading this. She is an editor at Bitcoin Not Bombs. She is a podcaster, um, which is and her podcast is all about crypto stuff and it's fun. She's a fire dancer. Still don't know what that is, but it sounds really hippie like. And apparently she started hosting the radio show Freedom Fiends recently, which I have heard of though never watched. Um, and we have another one of our uh, semi-stalwart and ever semi-faithful guests, Jordan Bloom, the uh, opinions editor of the Daily Caller. So uh, we have some good people here. We run sort of the gamut, as much as you can run the gamut with um, three guests. So welcome, everybody. Thanks for having me. I'm really distracted by a tiny spider that's hanging from my webcam right now. Um, <laughs> thankfully, I'm not afraid of spiders, but it's really distracting. Um, but I guess he can hang out there, too. Okay, so we had an election. The most important question for libertarians to ask, um, the first question being, did you bother to vote? And do you ever vote? And how awful slash pointless slash coercive is voting? Joe. Um, I've never voted for anything. Wait, um, really? I didn't, I didn't. Yeah, I've never. I'm, I'm registered as an independent, which I... I think I registered when I got my driver's license back in like 2004 or something, mm-hmm. and I've never read or never voted in any kind of uh, election ever. And I probably I, I will probably eventually, but I felt no need to. I got somebody to vote for Gary Johnson last year in my stead, so that was good. <laughs> I guess that uh, is is something. Um, are you gonna vote for Rand Paul if it uh, if the opportunity arises? If it was a real close election against Hillary Clinton or Elizabeth Warren or pretty much any, pretty much anybody, I might be tempted to cast a vote for Rand Paul. Mm. But Paul's are usually tempting that way. Only if I was not busy doing something else. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's time preference and all that good stuff. Uh, what about the rest of you guys? Are you voters ever this time? Not at all. Uh, well, what I are the uh, Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I don't know what order we're showing up on, on the screen there. Um, yeah, so I didn't vote this time. Uh, the last time I voted was for Nader in 2008, and I voted for Ron Paul in the primary. So I started out registered as a Democrat because I was really into the anti-war activism during George W. Bush's reign. Uh, I ended up switching to Republican to vote for Ron Paul, and then I switched to Libertarian and then became really disillusioned with the entire political process, so I stopped voting entirely, but we do make these really cool vote for nobody signs. I worked very actively on the vote for nobody campaign in 2012, and uh, we're going to reprint the signs for 2016, and I think that'll be really fun. So Nice. I voted for none of the above um, in 08 for president. That's my only voting time, so nobody is uh, similar in campaign platform to nobody, none of the above. They're, they're the same candidate, I guess. Um, well, Jordan, what about you? What are your voting? What's your voting history? Well, I didn't vote in this election, uh, uh, but I'm registered in Virginia. Um, one of the people that lives in this house, though, Preston Cornish, he ran for Ward Five chair. Oh, I know city. him. Sure, yeah. As a libertarian, and uh, he managed to peel off. Uh, I, I guess it was more than a thousand votes, which isn't bad, um, and. You know, kind of keep the the person he was running against, Kenny McDuffie. He's sort of the uh, the ordained next mayor with the perfect story and everything. And you know, so he doesn't really have to work very hard. And Preston was able to kind of you know hold him to a few things, um, particularly like McMillan Park, good localist stuff, um, drug war. Um, anyway, um, the, but also in, in in Virginia, I mean, Sarvis really was a spoiler, right? If if Sarvis mm. wasn't there, Ed Gillespie would probably have the Senate seat right now. Um, so I think libertarians do matter and probably increasingly so. 
the question is how many more Democrats are going to go that way? Um, so do we have, I'm getting the, the, no one's particularly like vehemently anarchistically opposed to voting. Um, yeah, I, I kind of was for a while, I guess, when I first got into anarcho-capitalism, but I don't really think the whole argument that voting is aggression really makes it far, uh, in the same way that the vote shaming on the other side doesn't make it far. For instance, I brought a prop for the show. They were mailing these to people in Florida. It says, don't throw away your vote and they mailed it to a friend of mine and on the back it says your neighbors will know it's public record and then it shows on the back the public records of the voting uh, the voting what the last people in uh, his neighborhood voted for so this is free I know but so they've taken to these like public shaming kind of things and I guess for you know ready for Hillary 2016 I guess they're taking the nagging harpy approach <laughs> to uh, getting people to vote now don't know that it's particularly effective um, but I also I don't know like I very um, I think if people want to vote they can I think it's just more ineffective and useless than aggressive or you know immoral or anything like that but I mean is it immoral to vote for the same assholes that generally get reelected is it is it immoral to, to um, reelect you know Lindsey Graham or somebody uh. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, I think if you're voting for really awful people, then there is more of an argument you could make from from that perspective. Like Lindsey Graham is awful. I mean, how that horrible person <laughs> keeps getting reelected is amazing. But then again, Lex Luthor won in Florida, which uh, we had a governor race with Charlie Crist and Rick Scott. Rick Scott, I call Lex Luthor because that's what he looks like, right. and. So Charlie Crist was a governor before Rick Scott. He changed his party affiliation from Republican to Democrat, challenged Rick Scott. So it was a former governor versus the current governor. So we really had shit chances, like, as far... And Adrian Wiley was the uh, LP guy, but... I mean, no offense to, like, Libertarian Party people, but the Libertarian Party candidates usually don't stand a chance, especially in a state like Florida, you know, where there's it's heavily entrenched in, in, you know, the two-party thing, more leaning towards Republicans, too, so... Yeah. Well, on the other hand, if you're going to call voting elect, uh, ineffective, it's also more effective when it's closer to you. So I guess it's harder to make that argument in local elections and things like right, that. Right, yeah. but it's, that. You know, if you're facing an election between Barack Obama and John McCain, I mean, fuck that. They're both, you know, <laughs> basically terrible. Uh, and, you know, so it makes more sense to kind of abstain uh, just because... I, I, I think you could make the argument that it's, it's better to abstain then vote for a third party candidate because it's sort of just saying I don't have any faith in this whole process. Right, that's kind of my approach. I don't have any faith in, in the entire process. So while a lot of my friends were very hardcore, like, oh, vote for Adrian Wiley, vote for the Libertarian Party candidates. I mean, it comes down to I don't really want to give any of my time to legitimize a system that I don't think benefits me in any way whatsoever. So it comes down to time preference and, you know, I, my time is very precious and rare. So it, what we were facing in Florida I don't think was really worth it. Um, even with some of the kind of local issues, I mean, you know, you're, I'm in a very heavily Republican area and I pretty much knew what would pass and what wouldn't and uh, even with some of those I didn't feel particularly motivated to vote. But I think if you do have, you know, I, I think it varies from state to state too though. Yeah, I mean, I spent the day, like, the local election thing, my friend, um, the local political pr reporter, harangues me about local elections and voting all the time. And it's super annoying, but there's definitely something to the fact that people frequently ignore the local stuff in favor of the big, uh, splashy national campaigns. And the local stuff is actually sometimes changeable in the way that the national elections really aren't. And yet, here we all are having kind of not paid attention to the most recent election. Um, so we're all bad people, basically. I paid attention. I just don't think my vote will change it. <laughs> you just voted it. Yeah, no, that's true. But like, I, I, it was a beautiful day out on election day, and I went for a walk, and my neighbor was walking his dog. And I thought we were doing, like, a Henry David Thoreau-esque, the state was nowhere to be found kind of vibe. And then he just like, so did you vote today? And I was like, no. And he was old and full of vote shaming. And um, 
Do you guys, you guys were in college not so long ago, all of you. Um, were you, were you all in college during um, Barack Obama fever times? Because I was. You even spoke at Mary Washington. Uh, it was, it was kind of indescribable what he, the sort of frenzy that would sweep the campus. I, I don't know. Really, everything was fixed after Barack Obama was elected. I know. Wasn't that amazing how that happened? Dude, the day that he was elected, I, I was so just truly, deeply, dystopianly disturbed by how the entire neighborhood of Oakland in Pittsburgh, like a very college neighborhood, they were in the streets chanting his name. And, like, I don't think that you need to be implying that, the, you know, the person is literally a dictator or is literally some cult of personality or anything, but it just you should be fundamentally at heart inherently disturbed when someone is in the streets chanting the, a politician's name, freshly elected, with the joy that these people were. Yeah, there were riots in some places, too. Yeah. It was horrible. Yeah, but I mean, like, awful. college years, though, like, I got, I, I spent my college years trying to annoy people, you know, by writing through the college paper, and the only time I really succeeded was when I said, I'm going to go and vote for none of the above in November 2008. And there was, like, there is this element, like, there's still this element of, like, in spite of how few people actually vote, there is this very, um, mindless propaganda that it is virtuous and, it, you know, no matter who you vote for, which they don't mean, but they pretend to mean. They mainly mean Democrats. I don't know. That, like, there's, there is a spiteful, spiteful impulse within me that, that makes me want to never vote again just for that reason. Well, it's totally self-interested, obviously, right? We can admit yeah. that. that. Democrats are the sort of mass, uh, they're the party of mass democracy. The more people vote, the better it is for them. Um, you know, but you're not supposed to extend that kind of thinking to immigration uh, or, or really the political process, right? Uh, because if you, I extending the franchise really does mean extending it to people who are less privileged, I guess. So there is, you know, it, it is true to, you know, voter ID laws are constructed to shut people out. That's the point. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think that makes them philosophically indefensible. That's and a whole other voting. big question. Uh, sorry, what were we saying? I was going to say this whole idea that we need to get more people out there to vote, like if we just throw more people into the machine of democracy, it'll work, is really ridiculous. Because what it comes down to is that my friend Michael Malice wrote a great piece uh, for The Guardian about this, about why he doesn't vote. I read and that. Was like, it was it was awesome. It was just very very you know uh, plainly stated, and you don't want more people voting if they're uninformed and they don't know what's going on. And this whole like voter die and like this ridiculous pandering to young people to make voting seem like it's this kind of cool edgy thing is just so frustrating and so like insulting as someone who is I guess is the demographic that they're getting for. Like I don't want to see Lena Dunham dancing around in her underwear. That doesn't make me want to vote. Vote. That's mm -hmm. insulting to me. Wow. And to say that, oh, we just need more people voting. No, like if it's a broken system, it's just like anything that's broken. You don't throw more money at it to fix it. <laughs> yes, you do. This it's is America, fundamentally America. broken. Like more people voting doesn't mean democracy is better. It doesn't mean that it's a more efficient system. It doesn't mean anything. It means there's going to be more idiots putting for, put, pushing through probably bad legislation. Well, that's the, that's the thing, when, when people, and again, this is, as bad as Republicans are in an entirely different way, this is definitely a more Democrat um, critique of Democrats. And they're also the ones saying, my God, this has been the worst Congress ever because they only passed, you know, X number of bills. As if, as if, like, that's, that is even more disturbing to me in a lot of ways, that literally the goodness of government is based on how much government you can cram in there. But it's the same idea. Gridlock. Right, right. I want gridlock, you know. I want there to be, like, 50-50 Republicans and Democrats and them get nothing done ever. That's, like, my ideal That's the dream. outcome. That's the dream. <laughs> you know, like, I, I mean, as much as I was enjoying kind of, you know, the, the liberal tears, you know, over, over the Republicans winning, at the same time I was like, well, shit, now that just means there's going to be more war. You know, there's going to be more crap that the Republicans do. Great. Yeah. I mean, all this, all the like Jezebel-esque, like, oh, the obstructionist Congress, like, 
Wouldn't you have loved to have an obstructionist Congress in 2003 so there was no war in Iraq? Like, right? Like, that's what you got. And you didn't get it in a time when it could have saved, like, an enormous number of lives. And now you're... It's because it's... Uh, it, I'm just going to get pissed off at Well, it. I think there's pretty much bipartisan agreement on war. And with John McCain kind of set to take over the Senate Armed Services Committee, he's going to be wanting to reverse sequestration. Um... I don't know. We'll, we'll we'll see. I mean, he was already he was already caught with his pants down taking pictures with Syrian rebels, and uh, I don't know. It probably won't lead to any more better decisions as far as foreign policy goes. But it does make a make it a lot easier for Rand Paul to make his foreign policy case. I think you could say that. That's optimistic. It's more optimistic than uh, Paul the Elder was uh, was tweeting about on on election day. Um, yeah, Rand hasn't taken a hard anti-war stance, though. I don't. I really don't lump him in with any kind of pro-peace candidates. He's just trying to make it a little bit harder to go to war. Yeah. You guys are such naysayers. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. no. I, I defend Rand Paul. Yes, I am. Scott Horton uh, despairs of me as to how much I would... Well, I mean, he's distracted by Justin Romando defending Rand Paul even more adamantly, so he probably isn't too worried about it. No, I'm not one of those anarchist uh, Rand Paul haters. I'm really not. Um, I can't I mean, care enough about Rand Paul to hate him, if that's any... <laughs> well, did you guys see his speech two weeks ago at the Center for the National Interest thing? He's actually trying to articulate a different kind of Republican foreign policy, right? If every incentive is geared towards more war, if you're fighting against those incentives, you're good by me. I mean, I think that's the test, mm -hmm. right? Um, okay. And... So he's actually trying to construct in, you know, I, I think I don't think it's too much to say at this point an alternative foreign policy cadre establishment or something like that that's intellectually respectable to give him the credibility that non-interventionist or isolationist views don't have. I don't. He rejects that label, obviously, but right. uh, I, I think that's something that needs. That's the only way to make it work, and it doesn't. You can't make it work if you're sort of dogmatically opposed to any kind of American power. Uh, I mean, the thing is, people always forget about um, Ron Paul, you know, voting for the war in Afghanistan and such. Um, people like, like, like Scott Horton, from anti-war radio, they, they they tend to act, you know, they, they tend to forget the earlier Ron Paul and how he wasn't as good as he became later in terms of war and in terms of becoming more libertarian. So. You know, not to presume that Rand Paul will only get better, but to presume that he won't actually potentially get better. I, I don't want to sound like an Obama voter circa 2007, because that's my great fear with ever thinking a politician is going to be okay. But well, we'll do better when every when when he gives speeches and you know a dozen columnists jump on him or stop jumping on him and calling him an isolationist. I mean, that's the incentives, right? Mm -hmm. He gets these things. When that incentive changes, then he'll be a little more, you know, free up to do do some things. Yeah, from what I've observed with Rand Paul, he seems better at playing the political game than Ron Paul. But that doesn't really make me excited about him anymore. Well, and then no, considering sure. that the GOP base, I mean, you know, you're looking at another decade, a little bit more before the people who need to die off to make his vision a reality. A reality. I mean, the, what we're looking at is huge opposition, even if that is, which it sounds like to me, a fairly reasonably balanced approach. I mean, he's got a base that doesn't support that. He's got a very hawkish base, and the thing is, you have to appeal to these olds who are going to be around for a while. I mean, I, I hate to say it, but you know, I don't think the Republican Party is going to make a major shift until you see a change of its base. Old people have to die. Yeah, it tends to come back to that in a lot of political discussions. <laughs> but I mean, at least he represents kind of the beginning, hopefully, of that wing. You know, it probably isn't just going to be you know that easy. That you know, Rand Paul wants a little bit more. You know, and not isolationism, but a little more. You know, congressional checks on war power, and you know, it has to start somewhere. And you know. Where he can't just you know magically have an anti-war president. It's probably not going to happen for a while, and Rand's probably not going to ever make it that far. But at least kind of you know if he can legitimize the idea of you know less war, I think it'll be good for everybody. 
Right, but I mean, on the other hand, in some ways you could argue that, well, I mean, Obama made certain war activities more easy to do, the drone stuff, sort of a constant low-level war, but at the same time, he didn't start any full-on boots-on-the-ground wars, so is he better? Is he giving us less war than uh, George Bush did? Because that may be true, but he's still not, you know, if you have a moral opposition to war, you're not going to be satisfied with, well, he's better than George Bush was. Well, so, so part, of, part of the thing is th that these uh, these non-neocons, the people who don't sort of fit into the Republican Party conversation, have all been forced into a corner. And kind of out of necessity, like the Kochs hosted a thing, it was, I guess, two weeks ago, I wrote about this, um, Barry Poston, the MIT professor, he's sort of a, a realist, he wrote a book called Restraint, and it was interesting, someone asked the question of how, of how does this all play out, what we're talking about right now, and, and he gave three answers, he said, the, the first one would be for Rand Paul to sort of build this, build the sort of people, the, the sort of cadre of, the, of people you could staff the State Department or Defense Department with. The second way is for some sort of catastrophic event to happen and it no longer becomes feasible for us to have this sort of imperial type thinking. And then the third way is sort of something in between that, the sort of the, the conversation changing in fits and starts, political incentives, other, other sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's pretty accurate. Uh, the, the, the collapse is, is really sort of the, the uh, um, most dramatic. And it may be the but most it, it sort of gets to the, the truth that he was talking about, that, uh, you know, it's no longer going to be sustainable. It's going to be, get progressively more costly for us to continue to be the world police. Right. It's not going to be easier. Uh, China and Russia are going to continue to make, and India too, are going to make that more costly for us. And we'll exhaust ourselves trying to trying to cope with that, at but least I mean, without rethinking what we do. But I mean, if you if you inter intervention can cause more, you know, reasons why you simply must intervene. So you're gonna you're gonna make more enemies that you simply must fight just this one time. I, I'm a, I'm very optimistic about the American ability to find some way to fight, you know, another conflict somewhere if they really want to, unless there's literally like you know. A, a completely catastrophic collapse of some kind, which I suppose is possible. But it's sorry, yeah. What would you say? I was just gonna say it's unsustainable now. I mean, it's not going to be unsustainable. Uh, the cost of war and human lives, and how much it costs to go, and how much of the budget is going to it every year is unsustainable. Yeah. And we've already reached that point. It's not a matter of making it to that point. We've already reached. That we tangled ourselves in so many different conflicts that it's a serious problem as far as scaling back how to do it from a legislative level or from you know other forms of levels. I mean, it's very uh, you know it's it's a really complex situation. As as anti-war as I am, I don't really see it stopping anytime soon until there's maybe another major attack. But even then. It's. I think that would just ramp things up. So yeah, it, I don't yeah. have the brightest outlook on uh, anti-war, no matter who's president, uh, especially if Hillary right. gets in there. Oh my, god. oh my god, that would be so awful. I mean, all that would give us would be an opportunity to mercilessly skewer various Democrats who would suddenly be on her team by pointing out that their 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 gal is um a massive hawk, you know, centrist at best, kind of borderline conservative in all the worst ways. But the entertainment value of that is going to diminish after a couple of weeks or months, and then we'll have Hillary, so. Don't you want a woman president, Lucy? Oh, yes. More than anything, Joe. Anti-feminist. <laughs> I would definitely, if I thought that that was an inherent tenet of feminism, I would toss it out the window <laughs> entirely. Um, yeah. That anyone, even even left femmes, could support Hillary Clinton is appalling to me because from everything she's said and everything she's done, she's way more hawkish than Obama. I mean, she's basically been calling Obama a pussy for the past several <laughs> months, like because he's not killing more people. Right. This is the people. Like, if you just listen to what she says, and she's not trying to hide it. She's not even like coding it in like flowery language anymore. Yeah, yeah. Really. Like, I'm waiting for her to like really just come out in 2016 and just.
just go like neocon. And, and the thing is, a lot of people either aren't going to pay attention or maybe the Republicans will run someone like Jeb Bush that'll just scare the shit out of all the Democrats and they're like, well, I know Hillary's this evil, like, you know, <laughs> hawk, but I've got no choice. I've got no choice. So... Come on, Clinton v. Bush. Let's just just kill America now. Rematch. Okay. I'm ready. Rematch. For the, the just it, for the honesty that 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 Clinton versus Bush would be. Just like no, it's they're all dynasties. Like there's no competition in thoughts. It's all good. Just there it is. We're not hiding it anymore. Yeah. I'm kind of ready for Bush uh, v. Clinton if we're gonna have awful, you know, two awful candidates, which is more than likely. I'm ready. Sixty-six percent of people voted for nobody in the last election. Last hey, yeah. election. I mean, nobody's won pretty much every election since. I don't. I don't know how far it's back. It's a mandate. Back it's a mandate. I it, mean. it should be. Yeah, that would be amazing if that just qualified as a vote. If you didn't vote, well, that means you. Just, there you won, won didn't have to be a president. Yeah, I don't know. Jordan, you want to you want to interrupt the anarchism, the latent anarchism brewing? Uh, no, 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 <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know what he believes sometimes, because he he switches it up on me. That uh, that guy. You, well, I mean. How about how about the next topic, Lucy? What's the next topic? We don't have any topics, Joe. Well, the, I mean, all right. So the 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 obligatory um, optimism is that I was waiting to, to confirm that Justin Amash would be okay in terms of uh, winning that back, back his seat, and it felt like it's disturbing to be dying for an incumbent to uh, keep on keeping on. But obviously, Justin Amash is the least evil politician at the national level that there is, so that's good. Um, and marijuana, everybody, marijuana is uh, making uh, inroads, and that's good. Except for Not in Florida. In Florida. Yeah. Where I'm from. We Not are, in Florida. So, oh man. Yeah. So so I found this out. So uh and this actually freaked a bunch of people out and I didn't realize that you didn't you actually need a super majority to get the amendment passed mm -hmm. in Florida. So this wasn't a matter of like fifty one percent. You had to get sixty percent and we got fifty seven percent. That's so wrong. That's so More wrong. people voted for legalization than for Rick Scott. Really? Yes. Wow. That, yeah, that doesn't I guess that doesn't really surprise me, but that's that's a good sign that they bothered that, that was relevant enough for them to get off the couch and stuff. That's the kind yeah. of voting that gives me optimism. Um I assume it was all the old people whose ex aches and pains might actually be helped with uh, the substance voting against it, probably. Yes, yeah. it was. Um, yeah, you actually, I, I come from, so Florida's really weird, you know, it really is like four different states in one, and where I'm at in the Panhandle area is very Republican, very, very, mm. very Republican. And then you, you shift over, like you should go a few counties over, like Tallahassee, Gainesville, all Democrats. Uh, then like Orlando, Miami is kind of mixed. You know, so it, there was really kind of we were ho hoping that the people in like Miami and Orlando might kind of pull through, but uh, but no, the the I think it was mostly the the older people who voted it down, and uh, I don't know that I really liked the way the bill was worded so much. I didn't vote uh, because I don't trust the state of Florida not to really screw this up. Mm. So, honestly, like, I, a lot of people are like, oh, it's it's the same everywhere, crony, you know, capitalism and politics and stuff like that. And yeah, it, it is, it is. But I, I've been in Florida my whole life, and Florida is awful. If there's any way that something could be messed up, they would find a way to do it. And it would just open the door for more re regulation and taxation, which I don't really want more taxes going to support the police in Florida or any other part of politics in Florida. We have some of the very worst police in this state and it doesn't bring me any kind of peace to have legal marijuana that's regulated and taxed. And it now, won't be small, I but. appreciate that argument, but I think that I mean it is it is a huge fundamental libertarian uh, quandary um, and it applies with the recreational thing as well. But I think that it's most Making sure that more people aren't thrown into prison or more people aren't deprived of potentially helpful, you know, easing their pain or easing their AIDS-induced wasting sickness or their chemotherapy, nausea, or all the other stuff that weed potentially helps with, I, I think it's worth it. 
Well, CBD oil is legal in Florida, so people who are looking to use it for those purposes can already use it uh, if they get a permit. So CBD oil is completely legal. Uh, you do have to go through a process to get the license. So that's still, you know, it's not completely prohibited in mm -hmm. that regard, That, but CBD would be the non-psychoactive portion of marijuana. Um, I get, yeah, I, I, it, I'm writing an essay on it that might be a little uh, controversial. My focus is more geared towards anarchists, uh, but I think I think it's something that's worth discussing just because you, you you can never trust where they're going to go with things, and it's worked well, I think, for Colorado. In fact, I, I am planning to move to Colorado in a couple of years. I do want to get out there, <laughs> uh, but I think for most of the people in Florida who are using it illegally or who refuse to get the CBD license, it hasn't changed much for them. They're still going to go through the same routes, uh, especially if they're using it to treat their pain. But I do appreciate the argument that you know, keeping less people out of jail. That depends on classification, though, which I'll, I'll be going into a little bit in this essay, because if they classify it in the same category as opiates and painkillers, which they had a huge crackdown on the last mm -hmm. few years, then it would actually be more, you'd have more of a potential for going to jail if you were pulled over without a prescription and you had a certain amount of weed that was a lower portion of weed uh, than, basically, if you had a lower portion of weed and it was classified, in the same category as opiates, then you'd have more of a chance of going to jail than if it were illegal and you had a larger quantity. Wow. That um, is a good uh, thing to know. This is why Florida is so weird, because you have to worry about this stuff with it. Like, you know, you have to worry how they're going, what, ultimately what it ends up being classified as. Well, that's a good argument to pay really close attention to the fine print. And the, the fundamental suspicion of, like, what are they going to do with this incredibly, for once, well-meaning, even to libertarians, regulation, uh, your, your, your suspicion and skepticism is probably um, a good quality to have. Um, the rest of you uh, gents, were you, were you happy about the marijuana or anything else about the elections? Yeah, it's great. DC, DC legalized it, and it looks right. like they're going to keep their hands off. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I ran, I ran Aaron Houston on that today, and uh, about how it's sort of setting the stage for 2016, and a number of swing states are going to have legalization on the ballot. Um, yeah, so I guess good news all around, right? I mean, I think so. Like, I understand. I get mad, you know, every once in a while when somebody busts a moonshiner, not just because I listen to too much country music, but because it's still somebody busting someone for illicit substance, you know, in spite of the legality of alcohol. So, like, I mean, the you know, the, the alcohol as it stands now, I mean, in Pennsylvania, where I am right now, it's incre still incredibly restrictive. It's gotten a little better in the past few years. Like, there's no... I'm not nearly moderate enough to, be, to think that, like, you know, the that is like the satisfactory system or like obviously the prescription drug restrictions that like the DEA and other people put into place and like it's not I'm not I'm, I'm not comfortable you know holding one of those sign that's signs that says regulation not whatever you know but at the same time people need to stop being put into prison and yeah, yeah. I'm all for decriminalization. If we could get the laws saying it's illegal overturned, that would be ideal for me. Don't tax it. Don't regulate it. I don't care about revenues. You know, yeah. just overturn the laws. Like, pass a law saying this law is no longer valid. The, the way that a lot of the languages, at least in Florida, is leaving it very open to a lot more laws to be passed, and that's going, I think it has potential to interact with some of the other laws that are already on the books and actually prohibit people, you know, maybe from owning a gun or something like that. So Right, which is something it's that's mixed. Happened, yeah. Right, right. So it I think this one is is very dependent on how precise the language is, which <laughs> anyone who's who's read through is any bill that's been passed knows that they try to keep very kind of open ended language or very vague language so that they can interpret it however they want, and that all depends on who's in office and who's interpreting it, so that can be scary. That's the horrifying thing about the government, it's like this elaborate trap, you know, it's like trying to, it's, it's, it's like, uh, I don't know what it is, it's, it's, it's just an attempt to get as much power as possible by weaseling around word choices. I remember talking to Justin Amash's like, 
communications dude a couple of years ago um, who was a lawyer. And he basically was saying, like, oh, you know, we, we talk about this all the time, how, like, they're, they're trying to make language as vague as possible, and they're trying to make sure that you don't understand what things mean. Like, it's, it's, it's very deliberate in a conspiratorial yet entirely uh, credible sort of way. Yeah, so the government's bad. <laughs> I don't like the government. But, but I'm glad to see that the litter has decreased around here. The That's litter? Like the litter. The signs. Okay, I guess you could call oh. them. <laughs> but Tidying up. Are they, are they not Tidying still up a little bit. Yeah. There's still some holdout Charlie Crist signs up, you know. <laughs> kind of like how there was like people still doing the McCain Palin things when Palin last. I go back to you were talking about being in college. After Obama won, like the next day it was like going to class, like waiting outside or something, talking to one of the this McCain Palin supporters. She was like, I wore my Palin button out of protest today. Like <laughs> she was like a heart like loved Palin. I was like, Really? You like really? But Whatever. We there were all tall people, so we were like, this is horrible. <laughs> oh, back in the day. So I'm really distracted by the uh, screaming tea kettle that's being unretrieved right now. Um, at least the spider's gone from uh, from my webcam. I mean, the thing about the weed stuff, like, it's nice that there's something to finally be able to, like, I get to participate in the system of democracy too by being excited that you know something actually concrete has progressed obviously in 2012 I really didn't care what ha happened but um, watching Colorado I thought wow maybe they're actually gonna fix this sometime I mean it's heading in the right direction like I've been saying it's gonna you know, it's gonna start slow but eventually I think it's eventually it's going to be, I mean, it's, it's going to be better than it was, I think, pretty much across the board within, I don't know, I don't know how long it'll take for every state and, you know, to pass at least some kind of decriminalization or medical marijuana law, but I think, you know, it's heading that way and it's only a matter of time. And then we can move on to, you, you know, meth and crack and getting those And all the people who are still in prison. Of course. Right, and then like a thousand years will be cool. <laughs> so I look forward to you when we're all dead. Jordan, <laughs> do you have something to add? Jordan? Jo Jordan's, uh, yeah. Jordan's whining to me in messages right now. I'm going to shame him. Yeah, I'm hungry. You're, why did you join my podcast if you were hungry, Jordan? Huh? Well, I, I didn't expect it to be 50 minutes long. <laughs> Okay, first of all, it's always that long. Second of all, we started at like 6.10, all right? So stop exaggerating. 40 minutes. Um, sorry. <laughs> no, it's, it's no, you're, 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 you're very full of good points and that are well-spoken and things like that. My, the men over here are hopeless. This is why we need feminism, because the men are so <laughs> incompetent. Jordan, do you have any opinions to share with the class? Opinions editor of The Daily Caller? I, I ran out of them at work today. Did you? They, they were all other people's, though, so, uh, nah. You, Good stuff, though. You should go read it. I'm not inviting any more men to my podcast ever again. <laughs> they're either fine. too dominant or they're too lazy. To go. Yeah. I thought so, we'd let the women talk for once. The women folk? No more so, mansplaining. We've there's never, that. this is like the second time there's ever been two Females spoken more than five words. It's true. Should we talk about some kind of social issue or something? Chivalry. Like, sh <laughs> is Jordan going to join us or is his blood sugar too low? We could talk about <laughs> the hot feminist topics of the day and how feminists care deeply about <sighs> non-shallow issues. We could talk about Wendy Davis in Texas. That's always a good one. And the shot in Florida. too. Oh, Jordan, would you like to share with about Wendy Davis? Please, please go ahead. Oh, I don't know anything about Wendy Davis. Uh, or I had nothing to share about her, but I was noting that Sandra Fluke lost as well. I forgot that she was running for anything. Um, Some sort of state yeah. senate seat. Yeah. Yeah, she lost by like 22. Her her again. 22. I assume uh, Clay Aiken also lost, but I didn't actually check on that. He yeah. did. He we read a story. I read the entire um, article about him in... Um, I don't even remember what publication, but I skipped like the real po politics. I was like, I'll read about Clay Aiken running for president. 
or running for um, Congress. And he was, like, so genial and seemed so likable, and his government was so, like, middle of... His views of the government were so middle of the road and awful, you know, like, just, like, vaguely about helping people. I mean, he, he honestly, like, I don't know why someone like that couldn't succeed, because he was so fundamentally, generically, like, the government is in all avenues of human endeavor, because helping people, etc. <laughs> He's a loser, Lucy. He couldn't beat Ruben Stuttered. And that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you remember his name. Um, that's that's impressive is what that is. Oh, Season wow. 2, American Idol. <laughs> <laughs> Back when America was paying attention to American Idol, it's true, yeah. Um, I, I read a really amusing article. I guess one of Wendy Davis's staffers had a massive Twitter meltdown and, like, I know this is bad. This is just pure skin food, but I just love it when that happens. Like yesterday, I was just reading all about the just the meltdowns people were having, and like, I'm sorry, that small part of me was just Ooh. like, yeah, yeah. So, um, but yeah, apparently she had a meltdown and like complete freak out, and I don't know, sucks. Don't do po don't do politics. Don't uh, be on campaigns because it's really hard work, and when you lose, it sucks really, really bad. And so, people like us will mock you help. without any sympathy. So there's also that. Yes. Yes. Well, hmm. All right. All of you except MK are unhelpful and worthless. So <laughs> what have we been enjoying in the past week that is not politics? Uh, Joe? Uh, I've been playing a lot of Minecraft lately. Okay. I'm obsessed with that now. It's, it's rough. I can't really think of doing anything else anymore. <laughs> so it's, a, it's a new video game that I've been addicted to. And other than that, you know, the Sorry. Penguins. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, I think on Saturday I'm going to a hockey analytics seminar at CMU. Oh, so that's awful. Why would you... I'm looking forward to that. That's sports nerds the combination. <laughs> I don't even know what to do with that. Um, what about you, MK? Uh, so I've been, I guess, exercising more, which is good. Um, I've been getting ready for Libertopia. I'll be doing a talk there and also be on a panel talking about Bitcoin charities. And my talk, well, my individual talk will be about Bitcoin and activism. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been kind of working on that, trying to tighten that up and just preparing for Libertopia. And then I also started co-hosting Freedom Fiends, which has been really fun. It's yeah, kind of sure. the first, uh... Yeah, it's my first foray into radio, so we'll see how it goes. Um, my show, I've been, uh, it's kind of on hiatus, I guess, at the moment as I prepare for Libertopia and stuff, um, but it'll be coming back, and I'll be finding uh, more crypto people to interview. So, uh, yeah, so things have been pretty good. Haven't been paying much attention to politics, which is, uh, I think, healthy. We like that. Uh, what about you, Bloom? I've been uh, mostly being unhealthy, uh, following the election and such, uh, reading a lot. Uh, I'm reading a Confederacy of Dunces and a collection of essays by William Styron, mm -hmm. one of which is really interesting. Um, he talks about, uh, can I tell this story? It's kind of cool. Uh, he goes with James Baldwin to the White House, uh, and they go upstairs to smoke cigars. Everybody's smoking cigars. And he and Lionel Trilling are the only ones there smoking cigarettes in a room full of cigar smokers. And he gets to meet JFK and all this other stuff. <laughs> um, you have the habit of a 40-something-year-old of dropping all of these names from, like, political science history, and you assume that everyone knows who they are, particularly people in your demographic. William well, Simon's a novelist. I, I, I know, but I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just making fun of your, your habits of being fancy uh -huh. and brains, yet also whiny and hungry. Um, I'm sorry, I like berating you. Um, I, mean, I mean well by it. Um, I, what have I been doing? I read Childhood's End by Arthur C. Clarke, and my mind went, and I don't even know if it was good or not, or if it was space collectivism. I don't even know, but um, it was an enjoyable process of reading it. Speaking of space collectivism, have you guys ever read any Bucky Fuller? Uh, no. That's a I great think all libertarians He's a total status, but uh, I don't know, an imaginative status. Okay. 
Yeah, I feel like a science, like a sci-fi or other type of themed podcast would be good. But I would actually be rather out of my element in, in a lot of that stuff because I've read like three Heinleins and one of every important dudes, and that's kind of all. So I would yeah. be out of my element. Um, I was also listening to the music of the dude whose band is awesome, um, and he was supposed to be on this podcast, but he had to do work things, and they're called Endless Mike and the Beagle Club, and they're really good. Um, and I'm going to Philly this weekend to hang out at the SFL conference there, and then I'm going to speak at the Pittsburgh one about how war is bad, and I need to actually finish writing that, um, which is a segue into self-promotion, um, which MK kind of did, and I'll do, because uh, I got to guest blog for Radley Balco at the Washington Post on Friday and Monday, which is nice. quite literally the highlight of my career, probably, in life in a lot of ways. Um, so that was really good. Yay, me. Um, and then I have usual stuff. Uh, yeah, go, go read that at the watch, and then read Radley Balco, and, and then also go to Anti-War, and also go to Rare, and also go to Vice, and also go to the Stag blog. Sure. In the world to read that all of which I wrote. Ugh, I'm tired. I need more sentences, spaces. Joe, promote yourself. Um, I don't know. If you're in Pittsburgh, my band's playing Saturday in West Mifflin, Act of Pardon. We also have an album. Go to the website, actofpardon.com. There you go. That's that's I'm not some... writing because I'm busy playing Minecraft. Well, that's still some good self-promotion. Mm, thank uh, you. Jordan, where should the people read your works? Uh, Daily Caller. I, I read the piece I wrote about the uh, Rand Paul and the Realists, and uh, and what's the other part? The Center for American Progress. And uh, I've also been doing a lot of blogging. Go to the uh, or dot net. Uh, we also send out a weekly newsletter, and should have some new contributors coming soon. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Considering yeah, your Considering your hatred of war and your, like, blogging about shape note singing on occasion, I feel like you and I should... There's there's, there's a special bond there, potentially. It's, it's beautiful. And the Secession News Roundups. Don't forget those. They're weekly. That's... That's right. Plus the shape note singer. I was like, I was like, Jordan and I need to talk more. This is beautiful. When I was reading your newsletter thing. So, yeah, your blog is good, even though it's full of too many words sometimes. It is, it is very good. I must compliment it. Yeah, it is good. Thanks. Um, we'll link to it. Okay, I guess Jordan needs to eat a sandwich or something. Um, <laughs> this was an attempt at, you know, I mean, I hate Paul, it's hungry too. I'm really hungry too. All right, this worked out pretty well as a free within conversation. It's the kind of dynamic libertarians we are. Um, Joe, thank you. MK, thank you. Jordan, thank you, but to a lesser extent, because you're whining. Um, audience, I will see, we'll see you next time on Politics for People Who Hate Politics, um, which is also for Liberty.me, which you should check out. All right. Bye now.